Welcome back to the YouTube channel. It's your boy, Mr. Ghana, baby. And I'm back again with another interesting and educative episode here in Accra, Ghana. But today, we are in the studios of Diaspora Network TV. The owner of this TV station was born in Ghana, left to the United States of America, and came back to establish this beautiful studio here in Ghana. So you know what? As we always do, we travel to get interesting stories so that it will inspire you. But hey, today I've been styled up by my own sister. This is called the Wadamaya jacket. Hey, please do me a favor. Go to my sister's Instagram. Go get one of this. Tell her that Wadamaya told you to order one of this. I look cool in this shirt, right? Amazing. But hey, it's your first time on this channel. Please do me a favor. Subscribe and be part of this awesome family. Let's hit 500,000 subscribers hi am maya follow me let's talk to the ceo finally mm -hmm. good to see you good to see you it's a privilege for me to see you for the first time and i really want to know your story uh, first of all i know the people watching us don't know who you are tell us your name and where you from well the name is uh jermaine Nkrumah. okay uh, i'm from the ashanti region kumasi uh, offense to be specific. Okay. Uh, you left Ghana? Yeah. To where? Well, it's a long story. Uh, actually, you know, I was a club DJ. And these guys, <laughs> they go abroad, they come to my club, have the time of their life. And so, you also want to go. I mean, you're young. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So my first stop ended up being Nigeria. Nigeria was your first destination. Mm -hmm. And from Nigeria to where? You came to Germany. Oh, you didn't come back to Ghana. You went to Nigeria. I actually did. I actually did. You know, um, I don't know how old you are, but in 1983, <laughs> there was what they call aliens compliance order. Uh, you see the Ghana, the bag Ghana must go. Yeah. That's where most of the Ghanaians packed their stuff. So that's where it became Ghana must go. So I okay. came back during that time. And then uh, I think a few months later, I was actually getting ready to go to London. And the homeboy did it to me again. Rollins did a budget that shot the, the price of the flight from my car to London from 6000 to 41000 Wow. So that, that right there. So you had to fly back to Nigeria? Yeah. I actually went by the road. Wow. Yeah. Then after Nigeria, where did you go then to? I went to Germany. Uh, I actually went to Germany through Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Germany, Eastern... East Berlin, across the border, Freddy Strassi. You know, the Berlin Wall, it was still up. But I mean, Germany eventually wasn't for me either because as a political refugee, you couldn't work. You can't work, you just stay at home, they feed you, they clothe you. But I wanted to work. I actually got a job as a DJ in Stuttgart. I played one night, they loved it. Uh, the uh, US soldiers, came to that club, they loved it. And so the guy was gonna hire me, pay me some good money. But when he asked me what's my working papers, I couldn't produce it. I was so devastated. So I decided, no, I can't stay here. So I figured out a way to get to the United States. Wow. Yeah. How long did you live in the United States? Off and I got there in 85 and I started coming back with a settlement, a resettlement agenda, starting the, uh, the fall of, uh, actually specifically November of 2011. Mm -hmm. By 2012, I uh, was fully here. Not fully, you never, even now, I'm not fully here because I get here, I stay here for about three months. My, my wife and kids are still back there, so I still have to shuttle between. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out like how long from 85 till now. Yes, yeah, 85 till now, but the last eight years I've spent more time in Ghana than I have in Texas. Okay, going back and forth. Yeah. Let's talk about your experience in America. Mm -hmm. Um, if you just if you should describe your experience living in America, what are the things that you're gonna say? I mean, the pros and cons living in America as um, a Ghanaian man or maybe as a black man living in America. Uh, it's it, that's an interesting question. You see, over there, life is much easier. No matter what they say, when you put it all together, it's easier. You're driving on express road in Houston. We have like 26 lane road, 13 going, 13 coming. 
and you can floor it. And when I mean floor it, you can gas it up where you're doing about 100 miles per hour and hope the police is not looking. And you don't have to dodge potholes. When you flip on the light, the light comes on, no questions asked. When you turn on the tap, so you don't have to deal with a lot of these things. Yeah. But on the flip side, you have to deal with crazy cops that we're now seeing, whose sole mission is to go out and kill blacks. On the other hand, you also have to deal with people, uh, bosses, who never see anything good that you do, no matter how your numbers say. Okay? If you are being evaluated and 70% of your evaluation is on uh, objective uh, metrics, that one he can't cheat you, but the, 30, the remaining 30% uh, percent subjective metrics, they can hurt you. No matter how clean this place is, they can tell you, oh, your place is dirty because that 30% is how he calls it. So he can hurt you with that, whereas you can go to uh, a, 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 a place of work where your colleague of a different race and you see what his place looks like and he's getting higher marks. Okay? When you see Obama comes in, does excellent job, doesn't get any credit. Trump comes on and he's riding the wave of the Obama economy. Yes, I said it. He's riding the wave of the Obama economy. And now they, they think that he, he built that economy. That's the story of a black man in America. Are you trying to say that in America, they see, like from your own story, mm -hmm. you're trying to say that they see black men as inferior or something? Well, I, mean, I know like, they do. I know they do. That's where the term white supremacy comes from. And so when you say something is superior, it stands to reason that the other ones are inferior. But I have a different opinion. I think it's about time that we blacks started talking about black supremacy. And I'll tell you why. Maybe you haven't heard that term before, but black supremacy is coming from the fact that if you put people in slavery, put all these impediments, these disadvantages in their way, and they're still able to rise above it to accomplish some of the things that they're accomplishing, who are you to tell me they're inferior? Do you think if the playing field was level in America, where nobody, right now white people are starting to talk about white privilege. If the playing field was level in America, you would see what blacks are able to accomplish in America. But the playing field is not level. And so I, as I sit here, I truly believe in, well, it's not a popular thing to say, but if other people are going to call themselves superior, we have every right to call ourselves superior because of the things that we go through on a daily basis and we're still able to rise above it to, to still move ahead. You know, like the main reason why I came here is mm -hmm. because of your TV network that you're mm -hmm. working on right now. What really inspired you to start something like this here in Ghana? Well, you know, uh, I think I have to take you back a little bit because okay. When I was on KUSC campus, okay, as growing up as a child, the Peace Corps, the American Peace Corps, and I think you wouldn't know, but it's a program that President Kennedy put together. So the Peace Corps would come, would go and interact with them. And I looked at Americans like, wow, because you see American pictures and everything. So when you finally see Africa, uh, you know, Americans in person, say, I want to go there so bad. And so eventually when I got to the States, two years after I got there, I actually put together, I produced a record called Home Sweet Home, if you need it. Because two years after being in America, it dawned on me that they are no different from us. They really are not. In fact, I have a statement, and some American friends don't like it when I say it, but I say, Americans are as dumb and as smart as we are. So if they think it's an insult, I'm insulting also. It, with the, 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 in short, in America you find the dumb and the smart, in Ghana you find the dumb and the smart. So if they can build their countries like that, who are you to tell me that we can't build Ghana like that? So starting in 1987, I've always believed that we really have something here. Exactly. And that is incumbent upon all of us black people 
both continental Africans who have left to go live in the diaspora and Africans who were born and raised in the diaspora, the African American, the Surinamese in the Netherlands, and I think there was some black group in Australia and all those. Yeah. All these people are Africans. Peter Tosh said, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. And this continent is for us. So we need to come back and, and really set it up. And so I, when I got the license to uh, put together a TV station, I could have called it any station, but I chose specifically Diaspora Network Television. Because if you look, the Diaspora has a vast network. This group here, this group here, this group here. I believe Africans, we need to at some point quit being individual, do things here, right. and put it all together because this continent is really something. It's really something. We got the desert, we got the forest, we got everything here. And we got the brains. Don't let anybody tell you differently. We've got the brains. But you know what? Somehow, we haven't been able to put together a system that put it all together so that we can develop this place. You know, um, you live in the diaspora, mm -hmm. and I know you definitely have friends and family who are still living in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a lot of Africans living in the diaspora watching us right now. Mm -hmm. So I really have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's worth it for Africans living in the diaspora to come back home and invest in the continent just like what you've done? Because some people feel like when they come in here, they're gonna lose money, you know? So from your own point of view, you're doing something in here. I know you lived there and then you came here to do something. So I want to know, do you think it's worth it for an African diaspora to come to the continent and invest this money in any business in the continent? Let me give you some numbers. Very, very good question. Let me give you some numbers. In 2019, Ghanaians abroad, their remittances to Ghana was $3.3 billion. That is the amount that the World Bank is able to track, meaning uh, bank transfers, money grams, Western Union, and all that. But you and I both know that the amount when somebody is getting on a plane and somebody says, oh, let's take these 2,000, somebody will meet you at the airport to collect it, right? That money is not recorded. Exactly. Okay? Now, we did our own poll. That's for network television. We did our poll. And our poll tells us that all Ghanaians abroad, 29.9% use uh, informal means of sending money home, which means put money in your pocket and everything. So if $3.3 billion represents 70.1% uh, of the money that comes in, simple maths tells me that the diaspora remittance for 2019 was actually 4.6% billion dollars, or I think $4.7 billion. Now, think about that for a minute. This is money that came in for which nothing, and that no natural resources left, except, of course, the, the, the human resource that left, fine. We didn't take gold out, they didn't take cocoa out, just just money that came in. Now, mind you, when someone is sending money to come home, maybe pay salaries or help with their mother's uh, this is not all the money that they have. In other words, it probably 10% of their earnings that end up coming home. And not all Ghanaians sent money home. So when you look at 210 million people of African descent all across the globe, and we, every country, we send delegations, go to China, go to Italy go to all these places and beg for money. And we have low hanging fruits. We, if you set up a diaspora bond, and I, I, I live in Houston, oh, I have a hundred dollars, I'll buy one. This one lives here, we buy one. We've got more money, we don't have to go and stand in front of anybody to borrow money. And guess what? That hundred dollars that I'm bringing home, if you give me even 5% return, I'm happy. Why? Because there is an intrinsic satisfaction of knowing that my money is helping to develop my country. 
that same hundred dollars that you went and collected from the uh, people of other races, they bring in that hundred dollars in and they want about two hundred dollars in return. Because when they troop in here to invest, they're not coming for free. They come in to invest and take more money out. So either way you slice it, Africans who are in the diaspora, in fact, let me put it this way, I dare say this, on a per capita basis, the 210 million Africans who live in the diaspora have a higher purchasing power than the remaining 1.2 billion that live on the continent. Why do I say that? Because you have precedents that make equivalent of $4,000 a month. Precedents on this continent that make $4,000 a month. In America, if you make $4,000 a month, you're really struggling, okay? You have people that make six figures, um, $100,000, $200,000 a year. So Africans have that money out there. Not only that, we also have resources. And then we bring something else to the table. We interact with our people on a daily basis. So if I'm sitting at a table speaking with an American, we're negotiating. When the, the American blinks his eye, I know what he means. When he scratches his nose, I know what he means. Why? Because we know their body language. Africans who live on a continent who have not lived with them, they don't know these things. And so we bring in much more than the money, the skills. We bring in much more. All we're asking, and this is what Diaspora Network Television is all about. All we're asking is the continent should take advantage of its diaspora, that's all. However you do it, whether you have to make some concessions, do it. Because we make concessions for Chinese and white people. We roll the red carpet for them. And they're bringing in $100 to take $200 back. But you will not roll the red carpet for your own kind who's bringing in $100 and will be happy to take $10 back. I don't get it. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, we Africans have to really look in the mirror and say, what are we doing? Is the diaspora a threat? That's why we make it difficult. Maybe we need to look at that. And those that are coming, are they too conceited? Are they pompous? That's what we need to look at. But at the end of the day, there's two sides need to sit down and figure it out. Because what is going on around the world? If you have dead bodies of black people washing up on the Mediterranean shore in Europe, you have blacks being killed in America. You have blacks being ejected in front, uh, uh, China. And we sit here and it's fine with us. Just because we can take the extra $2 million to go and put in a Swiss bank account. What are we? What are we? What, what kind of people are we? Because it, I'm telling you that if I'm white, if I'm a white man, and you, I'm dealing with you, I see so much poverty around you in your country. But you manage to take $5 million that I know you did not earn and you come and put it in your personal account, I'll never respect you. Why should I? <laughs> so for me, yes, the impediments are there, but for, uh, that's another thing that gets me. If we sit down and say, oh, the whites are doing so and so to Africa, the Chinese are doing so and so, do you think the Chinese ever spent one minute thinking about, oh, what are the Africans gonna do to our land? Do you think the Americans, oh, what are the Africans going to do? They don't think because we never play offense. We're constantly playing defense. And people are we're always playing victim or people are going to do something to us. No. We need to play offense sometimes. However we do it, I don't know. But this business of always playing defense or they're doing this to us, I don't mind that. I think at the end of the day, it's within our hand to grab it. And so far, we're not grabbing it. So far, you know, grabbing it. So, um, you know what? I just wanted to, before I let you go, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to send a message, mm -hmm. like a simple message mm -hmm. to the African in the diaspora. Yeah. Uh, not just Ghanaians, but I, I know all of them you are watching right now. Mm -hmm. So just a simple message to them. What would that message be? 
That message is this. Africa is your home. There are constraints when you want to come back or look back. And by the way, we're not saying everybody should come back. No, it's virtually impossible because we know Africans have built their house, their lives there. But look back. And by looking back means let the issues of the continent concern you. If it's open, you can open some business here, have somebody run it or keep it close. And these days of social media, you really not to, when I leave here and go back to Houston, for the time that I'm there, I'm still able to run this place. And so I want Africans to start to look at the continent as home. And nobody's gonna develop it for us. If people tell you, oh, we're giving you aid, it's a long strength attached. And so, come home, you will face problems. But I, I guarantee you, the same way, this is actually, this is actually <laughs> it. This is, this is interesting. Yeah. When I left mm -hmm. to go to the United States, yeah. I had no idea where I was going to sleep. I had $20 in my pocket. Just $20? But I took that chance. Okay? Look at how many Africans take that chance fly into a foreign land not knowing what to expect. But we'll take that chance. But when it comes time for us to come back home where we're familiar, where we have family, where we have old friends, we think, oh, it's too risky. I don't know what to expect. Hello? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I feel like um, we don't actually believe in ourselves and we don't believe in what we have. That's why all these things are happening. That's what I've noticed, yeah, because you might end up going to another country, just like you're saying, and survive with just $20. But coming back here to survive with only $100, they'll say that's a yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> you say, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, the things, the roads are bad. When you were going there, you knew you were going to find problem. Do you know how many people have actually got to the United States? My own brother. He came, and sometimes he said, is this America? I said, no, no, you haven't reached America yet. You're in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> because people, you go to these places with stars in your eyes, but when you get there, reality hits you in the face. But then you have to navigate through all those problems and make a life for yourself. Why can't we do that when it's time to come back home and we say that uh, we know we're going to have problems? Yeah. But the good thing is these problems, you're already familiar with them. So you know how to navigate with them. This is where your umbilical cord was cut. So you know them. Come back home and everything will be good. Um, before I let you go, final message. Um, can you tell us how we can find your TV network and how we can stream wherever we are? Very good. We are on the multi-TV platform and we're currently present in Ghana and in African, uh, about 24 African countries. We are working on getting on several platforms because right now we're truly global. And so for the rest of the continent, we reach them uh, through social media, but not for long. Uh, we're working on an app that would eventually um, be able to put our broadcasts and it will sit on our own server. So people will be able to watch us on, um, on, their, on their mobile device. But for now, our website, uh, www.dntghana.com and social media handles YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All right. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you so much for talking You're to welcome. me. welcome. And by the way, you, you're doing an outstanding job yourself. Keep thank that you up. so much. All right. I appreciate your time. I like how you're showing Africa in a way that... Uh, <laughs> to you, make people like you need to come yes, home. Yes, yes. You're doing very good. All right. Thank you.